If you know this song, sing it with me. Let it breathe on me. Let it breathe on me. Let the breath of God now breathe on me. Let it breathe on me. Let it breathe on me. Oh, let the breath of God now breathe on me. Mary, whose hometown was Nazareth, had the breath of God, the Spirit of God, breathe upon her and place the seed of God's own Son. Jesus was born. He had knew no sin. He was not born with a sin nature. He was not a son of man that was fallen, but the Son of God, His Father. And He knew no sin. He lived sinless. He went to the cross for our sin, and He paid the perfect sacrifice that you and I should not die because of our sins, but live forever. Aren't you thankful? The gift of Christmas is Jesus, and he, come, he came to earth knowing that He came to seek and save the lost and give His life for us that we might live. Today I'm talking about the topic of the King is born, Jesus Christ, the King of kings, the Lord of lords. His name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. And of his government, of his kingdom, there shall be no end. And he will reign forever and ever and ever. And we, as his children, we are joint heirs with God, with Jesus Christ. Heirs and joint heirs. And we are his children. And we have that same Holy Spirit to come upon us that has placed a new heart in us. The Spirit that has made us born anew. That's taken our selfish, sinful self that's full of pride and greed and lust and given us a new desire. Given us a new power. But by the Spirit of the Lord, we overcome the evil one. This king has all authority. And today, if you haven't bowed to the authority of the king, Jesus Christ, today is your day. And at the close of this service, I want to invite you to come and say, Jesus, I don't just believe in you. I don't just believe in your birth story. I don't just believe in your death story. I don't just believe in the resurrection story. But I surrender my life and declare you the king of my life. And I surrender to you and make you Lord of my life, and you will confess Jesus Christ as Lord, believe that God is raised you from the dead, and you will be saved from the damnation for, that are for all people who reject Jesus Christ, the damnation that I'm guessing Herod the Great faced. How many of you ever heard of old Herod? He was king of the Jews, but the text tells us that we're going to read in just a moment that Jesus was born king of the Jews. The wise man says, where is he that is going to be born, the born king of the Jews? And so today, I want to tell you, in case you don't know, this king is born, and he was born around 7, maybe 6 B.C. B.C., that's not the year zero. Look at me. Don't be bit ignorant. Sometimes information helps you because the devil is trying to talk the whole world out of believing in God and believing in the miraculous virgin birth of Jesus. Why is it the virgin birth of Jesus, the Holy Spirit? Because he was not born a sinner. That's why. He was second Adam. He knew no sin. He had no sin nature. And he lived sinless and he died the perfect sacrifice. That's why theology is important. And it's clear in Scripture, and no one can talk you out of it. And Jesus was born 7, we don't know exactly, but 7 or 6 B.C. And we know that because Josephus documents when uh, Herod died. And Herod died in March of 4 B.C. And we know that in, when we read the story in a minute, that Herod had calculated in his mind uh, exactly when it was that... Uh, uh, the, that that the, the, the star appeared to the wise men and he wanted to know exactly when it was so he could, just in case, he could kill all the boys that were in Bethlehem that might be that Messiah because his job was to have no other king but himself. 
And you know, a lot of people, they don't, they don't mind believing in this and believing in a little bit of that, but they don't want any other king except themselves. That's the way a lot of people are. Herod died in March of 4 BC. That would put Jesus about the age of my grandson, about three, three and a half, when he left Egypt to come. And he was going to go to Judea. He's probably going to go back to uh, Bethlehem area where Joseph was from. But in Judea, one of the, the, when Herod died, the kingdom was split up because he had ruled there like 40 years, if I remember right, something like that, Herod did, as the king of the Jews. And, uh, and, and the kingdom was split up between three of his sons, and in the area of Judea was Archelaus, his son Archelaus. And he was evil like his dad. Here's the thing about Herod. Herod married a, a woman, had a child by the child. He met uh, a, another Jewish, young Jewish woman who was 18 years old. He was married to her until she was 25 when he had her put to death because he was concerned that she was going to take his kingdom. He killed his own wife. He killed three of his sons. She gave him, I believe it was five children in those seven years they were married, and yet he killed them. He was barbarous. Matthew's the only one that records the fact that Herod had the babies put to death, two and other boys, two and under. He's the only one, but no one else writes any kind of contra contradictory. There's nothing contradictory in any kind of literature in that time that contradicts that. And it goes exactly fittingly with Herod who went crazy. Now he loved his wife, but he was afraid, so fearful of, of someone coming after him. In fact, he built 13 castle fortresses. The most famous Masada is beautiful, unbelievable, architecture beyond measure. You can't even have to go to Israel and see it. And he also built a place for himself called, that he called the town, and he built a town with a great, a great huge pool. They would even sail boats in and swim in, and it was an absolute castle top town right, in, 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 right just a, a two or three miles away from Bethlehem. And there was two hills side by side, and he took and he had slaves and others that, he, that they would hire. They would totally move one hill to build up the other hill to where it was a mountain. It was a perfect fortress. He was fearful someone was going to come after him, take away his kingdom, kill him, and it's a huge. You walk up it, it's like forever. It's, it's like really a sharp incline, and it's up there. And up there, he built this, this uh, place, this, a beautiful place of burial. He wanted to be immortal. And he built several places. He built several caskets for himself, for himself to find. And in excavation, they named the place. He named it after himself, Herodian. Look it up. Look at my Facebook. I've got uh, 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 from um, mm, 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 uh, uh, Channel 11 or the uh, History, History Channel, History Channel uh, put some stuff out. And so some of the stuff is right, some of it's not so documented. But anyway, the one I put on there, the first one is good, and you can see other ones to learn about this. Because it's important you understand this King Herod. Uh, Josephus War. Book 1, number 665, and, and the Josephus Antiquities book, number ch chapter 17, verse uh, one, sentence 190 and 191, tells as well as substantiated in Matthew 2, two when Herod died, March of 4 B.C. 7 B.C., March of 4 B.C. Well, you know how a years can follow? So it could be three, it could be three and a half, it could have been two and a half, but by the time the wise men came and they saw the star. Herod had calculated and he figured, if I kill all the boys two and under, I'll get that Jesus. But God had a plan. Let's read about it right here. Uh, Matthew 2, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, Matthew 2, during the time of King Herod, if you have your Bibles, open it. If you have your uh, tablets, open it. If you have your phone, open it. Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, where is the one who has been born King of the Jews? We saw his star when it rose, and we've come to worship him. When King Herod heard this news, he was disturbed. And look at this, and all Jerusalem with him. When he had called together all the people's chief priests and teachers of the law, he asked them where the Messiah was to be born. In Bethlehem and Judea, they replied, for this is what the prophet has written, for you, but you, Bethlehem, in the land of Ju Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah, for out of you will come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. And note this verse, Mark verse 7 and 8. Then Herod called the Magi, look at this word, mark it, secretly, secretly, and found out from the, the exact time the star had appeared. He pulled the wise men aside and he whispered secretly, exactly when did you see the star? Exactly when? 
And then he sent them to Bethlehem and said, go and search carefully for the child. As soon as you find him, report to me so that I too may go worship him. After they heard the king, they went on their way. Uh, and a star they had seen when it rose went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were overjoyed. On coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and worshiped him. Then they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to their country by another route. And when they had gone, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream. Get up, Joseph, he said. Take the child and his mother and escape to Egypt. Stay there until I tell you, for Herod's going to search for the child to kill him. So he got up. He took the child and his mother during the night and left for Egypt, where he stayed until the death of Herod. And so was fulfilled what the Lord had said to the prophet, out of Egypt, prophesied in year, hundreds of years before, out of Egypt I called my son. Now mark this verse, number 16. When Herod realized that he had been outwitted by the Magi, he was furious and he gave orders to kill all the boys in Bethlehem and its vicinity, and its vicinity who were two years old and under, in accordance with the time he had learned from the Magi when he pulled them aside secretly to find out exactly when did you see that star. And then that was what was said through the prophet Jeremiah was fulfilled. A voice is heard in Ramah. This is, this is the area of Bethlehem. It's the region of Bethlehem. A voice is heard in Ramah, weeping in great mourning, Rachel weeping for her children and refusing to be comforted because they are no more. Think of the weeping of the mothers of those boys. After Herod died, an angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt and said, Get up, take the child and his mother, and go to the land of Israel. For those who were trying to take the child's life are dead. Notice the, that an angel came again after he died to Joseph in a dream. They did, Joseph and Mary didn't just hear about it. God went and said right away, He's dead. Go back. You get that? Notice that? So he hears about that. And... Uh, and then he says, verse 21, so he got up, took the child and his mother, and went to the land of Israel. But when he had heard that Archelaus was reigning in Judea in place of his father Herod, he was afraid to go there. Wise he was. And he went and lived in a town called Nazareth. So was fulfilled what was said through the prophets that he would be called a Nazarene. See, like Herod today, he, he was king. He was paranoid. He didn't trust anybody. He was fearful for a coup. He was fearful for someone to overtake him. He was fearful for his life. And he lived a miserable life. Uh, and like many people today, Herod want to be the only king. Many people today want to be the king of their life. They don't want anybody telling me what to do. You're not going to tell me what to do. They're not going to tell me what to do. Well, I think this and I think that. And no matter what the king says or what the book says, I think this. And people want, you know, people may not want to murder King Jesus like Herod, but you know, in our world today, there are many people murdering Christians and murdering children, and they hate Jesus and they hate the Word of God. And even in our culture in America, things that we believe that the Bible stands for and says clearly, many people mock you, belittle you, try to silence you, call you a, a bigot, call you narrow, call you all kinds of names to get you not to believe what God teaches and to live holy like God wants you to live and silence your voice for righteousness and holiness. And people hate what Jesus is and hate what Jesus stands for and what the Bible teaches. You know, others uh, will believe in Jesus and be religious, but they make up their own rules to follow. And if they don't like something that Jesus has to say, they say, well, I don't really agree with that. But you know, a king has authority. Is Jesus king of the Jews? Is he king of kings, like the Bible says, and Lord of lords? When he died, it was written, king of kings and Lord of lords, and he was. That's what he was. And a king has all authority, but most people in this sin-darkened world don't want any authority but themselves. They are the ruler of their own life, and they won't do what the Bible says to do, which is to humble yourself before Almighty God, and, uh, and God resists the proud, but He gives grace to the humble. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. And I want you to know, Herod is a type of Satan. He is a type of the Antichrist, and Satan is real.
You hear me today? And the Bible, there's a song that's, uh, a mighty fortress is our God. And one of the verses talks about Satan, that on earth there is no equal, and there's no formidable, he's a formidable foe, and that us as individuals, we, we cannot overcome him. We have reason to fear him, but let me tell you something. There is a formidable foe for Satan. There is one that's greater. There is one that has more power and more authority, and his name is Jesus. And without Jesus, you are nothing but a pawn on a chessboard moved around in his purpose and will. And without God's Spirit, without Jesus Christ in you, you are lost, you are done. And let me tell you something, today more than ever, and all believers is why Jesus said, it's good that I go away, because if I don't go away, I won't send the Holy, I, I, I can't send the Holy Spirit, but if I go, I'm going to spend the Spirit with, upon you. And He'll be in you, and He'll guide you in all truth, and He will strengthen you. And let me tell you something, you and your human flesh and your willpower is no, no match for Satan and his devilish schemes and his tricky ways and his wittiness and what the Bible calls the wiles of the devil, the arrows of the devil are pointed at you, and you will lose and not even know you lose, and you'll be one of those people someday that go up to heaven and you've been deceived all your quote-unquote Christian life, and he's going to say, hey, I never knew you'd depart from me. You said, yeah, but I prophesied in your name, and I cast out demons in your name. He says, hey, I don't care what you did. I don't know you. You don't know me. Get away from me. And I want to tell you, this world, this religion is not a belief system. It's not a formula. It's not knowledge about God. It's power of God. It's the same thing you're born again. The Holy Spirit that put Jesus in Mary. The Holy Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead. That same Holy Spirit is in you. And He's our conqueror over the Herods in this world. He's our victor over the enemy of our soul, Satan. And He is absolutely no match for Jesus. It is a powerful name. It is a powerful name, and he's the, the name of Jesus is by which we are victorious today in no other name. And, and through the blood of the Lord, the Lord Jesus Christ, and through the testimony of our mouth of who Jesus Christ is. Do you say with your own mouth that Jesus is your Lord? Do you mean it in your heart? Do you believe it in your heart that he's alive and he's with you? Do you? Because that's our victory in Jesus Christ. We see how Herod and Satan have so much in common. And Satan hates everything God stands for and God loves. That's why he hates you. Oh, but he's he going to make you think. He's not going to, you know, he, he doesn't want to tell you that straight up. He won't say to your face like a lot of people, I hate you and I'm going to kill you and destroy you. No, uh -uh. he acts like he's your friend. He whispers up to you. And he tries to get you to follow him straight to the pit because he knows his days are numbered. And we know that Satan has already got a place, and that's the fiery pit. That's where he's going. And the fate of Satan is already done, and he knows his days are numbered. But see, Satan hates what God loves, and God loves you, and God loves everybody. And God does not want anybody to perish, but that all have everlasting life. That's why he sacrificed, believe it or not, his own son, that we could have life. That's what Christmas is about. He came to seek and save the lost to give his life for us. And God loves you that much. But Satan hates you because he hates everything God loves and he desires to destroy you just the way the evil, the egotistical, murdering, murdering demon-possessed Herod tried to kill Jesus. The Bible says in 1 uh, Peter 5, 8, be alert, be sober. In other words, put your thinking hat on, pay attention. It's not talking about not being drunk. It's talking about being serious and realizing you are in a war. You better have your sword with you. You better have your helmet on. You better have your breastplate on. You better have your feet shot. You better be ready because this is serious business. And we are against enemies. It says, be alert, be sober in your mind, a sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour, seeking whom he may devour. And here's how he does it. Point one, he's deceptive and he whispers in secret. Look at verse 7 again. It says that Herod called the Magi secretly and found out from them the exact time the star had appeared. Secretly. Secret. You know, what happens in the dark is evil usually. In secret. God wants things on top of the table. He wants truth. Truth in the inward parts. Openness. Honesty. And, and Satan always works in the dark. He always works whispering. And... Uh, I may ask you a question. Do you whisper in the dark? Do you tear down? Are your words poisonous? 
We don't like it when others tear us down, yet somehow we think it's okay to fight back because after a while we're hurting naturally. We just fight back and we tear people down. Over and over we're told or admonished to one another, to exhort one another, to encourage one another, to love one another, to care for one another, to build one another up. Paul says in all 13 of his letters, he says to contend for the unity of the faith, not to destroy people. We love to walk in mercy and grace and love and let our, se- our speech be seasoned with grace. Yesterday I was looking at verses with Wren, and we looked at 27 verses that have to do with your words. It's unbelievable what it teaches. In fact, I didn't know this verse, I'd forgotten it, but it, I've said this many times. You're never going to let something go and forgive it if you keep talking about it because the Bible teaches words are life, that the power of the tongue is life and death. And that if you keep talking about something and you're hurt about it, then it's just going to keep it alive like scratching. I always say like scratching the, a scab off of something. It just keeps it alive and the hurt just lives on and on. Just close your mouth. Use your words to praise God. Use your words to bless God. Use your words to encourage people. Be quiet. Just like Jesus, when he hung on the cross, he says, Lord, forgive them. They know not what they do. You don't know what you're doing sometimes. I don't know what I'm doing sometimes. We make mistakes, but God will forgive us, and we need to forgive each other. Don't be a tool of the devil who whispers in secret and wants you to whisper in secret. Satan whispers to destroy Jesus. He whispers to destroy his church. He whispers to you about others. And Satan will look for a a crack in your life, a a weakness in your life, a self-crack, something he can tear us down to make us believe or tear someone else down. For instance, to jealousy. If you have a tendency to be jealous, he whispers, they think they're so great. To insecurity, he whispers, you're so dumb. (laughs) You're ugly. You're not worth anything. Life stinks, and so do you. You should just kill yourself. To pride, he whispers, they don't know what they're doing. Can you believe those idiots? Oh, oh my goodness, how disgusting. I'd never do something like that. What a brain-dead bunch of people. I'm the one. Can you believe that church over there and that church over there and that church? Our church is the only church. We got it all together. No, we aren't. To greed, he whispers, You deserve it. After all, you're smarter than they are, and you deserve it. You're a self-made man. To the lust, he whispers, nobody will know. It won't hurt anything. Or, we're two consenting adults. Or, I just can't help it. I was just born that way. Or, God understands. My wife, she's a prude. It's okay. No, he doesn't. Satan's lying. He's a liar. To selfishness, he whispers, Take it. They have plenty. You need it more than they do. Just take it. Or he whispers, ah, the church has plenty of money. You need that tithe money more than the church. All churches want anyways your money. They don't care about you. Or to the selfish, he may also whisper, God understands. It's okay. Just do whatever feels good. You know, live for yourself. Have a good time. Life is short. And when he says life is short, he's saying the Bible is wrong, that there's an eternity, and that we should live for the kingdom of God and the things that are invisible, the things money can't buy, the things death can't take away. He's telling you life is short, just live it up. No, it isn't short. It isn't short. It's eternal life, and we live now for God and the kingdom of God. And Satan whispers that, and he's saying don't seek first the kingdom of God, but go for the gusto. Be a Burger King boy. Have it your way. That's supposed to be funny, but true. Sinners many times make evil plans, whispering behind closed doors. Plans to cheat, plans to deceive, plans to manipulate, take advantage, to make money, or to get power, or to get back at somebody, to be hurtful. Plans that use other people, but love money, which is opposite of what we should do. We should use money and love people. Here's what the truth is. Satan is against you, but God is for you. God loves you. You're fearfully and wonderfully made. God has a purpose and a plan for your life. 
He, he, he wants to prosper you and bless you, not to harm you, but to give you a hope and a future. And here's the truth. God loves every person in this world, and he offers eternal life for everyone. It's not his will that any perish. His truth and his voice says, trust in God. Put your faith in Jesus Christ the Messiah. Live for him and not yourself so that you can be free forever someday. When Jesus comes, when you enter into heaven where there's no sickness, no pain, no more, no more death, no more suffering, no more parting, no more, none of the... None None of that stuff, the, the emotional turmoil, it's gone. The truth says, make Jesus your king and now, right now, and he has a special place for you, and he'll be with you. You may have a hard time sometimes, but he'll be with you. And let me tell you, when you make Jesus your king, you're a part of a kingdom that will never end. His kingdom will never end. And of his power, there's no equal through of Jesus Christ. He's the Lord of all, Lord of all. To the sinner, sometimes Satan whispers, it's too late for you, or Jesus won't forgive your sins. To the spiritually weak, he whispers, you fall all over again. You keep doing that same thing and say, oh God, forgive me, then you do it again. Oh God, forgive me, then you do it again. Oh God, forgive me. And you don't mean it, and God is sick of it, and you're going to hell, so just live it up because you've had one too many chances and you're done. That's what the devil lies to you and whispers to you. Or to some people, he whispers this, the biggest lie of all in our culture. All sin is equal. Nobody's absolutely sinless perfect. So, you know, it's okay. I know you live with a woman you're not married to. But, you know, every once in a while they lose their temper and say a word. Why do you think God has ten commandments? Yeah. The Bible says, when you knowingly, willfully live a lifestyle of sin, whether it's cheating, lying, stealing, whatever else you're doing, hateful, unforgiving, mean, you're, you're uh, uh, living in an immoral, immoral life, when you willingly do that, it says, while you do that, there's no, don't count on the forgiveness of sin. Until you apply the blood of Christ and get back in fellowship with Jesus Christ. And that's, I didn't say it, the Hebrew writer said that. You go figure it out theologically, but I'm telling you right now, Jesus Christ, God, it says when you do that and you go, oh, well, that preacher, he's not perfect. I mean, he's done stuff. That's, that's right. I have. But make an excuse to live in sin and you'll see what happens someday. Because the Bible says you're, you're treading on the blood of Jesus and insulting the spirit of grace. The spirit of grace. Look it up. It's an insult. You can't do that. There's a time when God says, absolutely not. The blood that covers you and flows over you gets stopped when you say, I'm going to do what I want. And there's a lot of people preaching in this world. They're preaching uh, uh, universal salvation. All you got to do is believe about Jesus. It's not. You can believe, like I said, about his birth. You can believe about his life. You can believe about his death. You can believe about his resurrection. But belief doesn't save you. God saves you by his spirit. He comes in and he, and he regenerates you and makes you brand new. There's a power of that in the Holy Spirit. And today, we need the Holy Spirit to change us. And we can't sit around believing that we're powerless to sin. Why do you think Jesus said, go and sin no more? It's not, I don't know if he means sinless perfection. But what he's saying is, repent. Go, sin no more. In other words, don't be powerful, powerless to sin. In fact, when the Bible says, call his name Jesus for he saves people from their sin, he didn't say forgive their sin. He says save them from the power of their sin. That's what he's talking about. We are more than conquerors in Christ Jesus, but we have to be in Jesus. We have to have the Spirit. Jesus is no longer on earth. He's at the right hand of God the Father, but he sent his Spirit, so we need his Spirit. And you may need to be refilled. You need to be more doused with more of his Spirit. You have the Word of God come alive in you, become a raven word, so that the power of the Word is in you, so that when the devil faces you, you can say, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. And if you've never repented and been baptized in the name of Jesus for the remission of your sins, you need to repent and get in the baptism waters. Amen? That's what we, the Bible says to do. And if King Jesus says do it, then let's do it. Amen? Let's do it. I'm going to tell you something. Satan also will whisper this. Here's what the truth is. It's because the devil says, hey, you've blown it and you're done. You've sinned over and over. The truth is if we confess our sins, 
He's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And Satan will also whisper to the upright citizen, you're not a sinner, you're a good man. You don't need to repent, you don't lie, you don't cheat. You're not immoral. You live a good, clean, honest life. You'll go to heaven, don't worry. You don't need all this church stuff. The truth is there's none righteous, no, not one, Romans, other than Jesus Christ. The truth is, Romans 3.23, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. The truth is, the sins, when it's finished, brings forth death. That's the truth. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, and the only one, Jesus, is the way, the truth, the life. And no one can go to the Father in heaven. No one will be saved. No one will end up in heaven without Jesus Christ becoming your king, king of my life. A king is born. Is a king born in you? That's the question. Are you like Herod? No other king but me. I am the king. Not only do we see his secretive, deceitful ways, we see his lying and murderous ways in verse 8. In verse 8, we see, he says, he sent them to Bethlehem and said, go search carefully for the child. As soon as you find him, report to me so that I can go worship him. He wasn't going to worship him. He was going to kill him. What a liar. He's a liar. In verse 16, he says, Herod realized he'd been outwitted by the Magi. He was furious. They outwitted him. That's the way he thinks. They outwitted him. They didn't outwit him. God told him to go another way. He, that's the way he works. Wit, outwitting people being a sneaky little snake, and he gave orders to kill all the boys in Bethlehem and its vicinity who were two years and under in accordance with the time that he learned from the Magi. In other words, he was lying and he was murderous. And I already told you the history of how many people he murdered. James 4, 6, and 7 says, but he gives more grace. That's why the Scripture says God opposes the proud. The proud will not admit their sin or they won't repent. They won't bow their knee. They won't turn from their sin. They won't get baptized by water. They won't do it. Proud. God resists the proud, but he shows favor to the humble. He says, so therefore, submit yourselves then to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Notice, resist the devil. Why? Because the devil is after you, and he's pushing you and enticing you and coming at you, trying to get you to live for yourself. You've got to fight him. The Bible says we don't wrestle in Ephesians 5. We're not wrestling against flesh and blood, but principalities and powers and wickedness in high place. That the schemes, the wicked schemes in, of the evil one are pointed at you. And therefore, put on the whole armor of God. Get the Word of God around you like a belt of truth. Get the shoes set up with the gospel of peace. Put on that helmet of salvation. Take up the sword of the Word of God, the sword of truth. Be warriors. Be alert. Be vigilant. There's a Herod that's worse than Herod living today, and his name is Satan and he wants to destroy you. Do you realize that? I'm not kidding. He wants to destroy your kids. He wants to destroy your grandkids. He wants to destroy your neighbors. He wants everybody going to hell with him because he knows his days are numbered. Satan hates God and Jesus and he hates you. He wanted love and devotion from men and has wanted to be God ever since Satan got kicked out with a third of the rebellious angels. His little minions How? No power to stand up against Jesus. And the spirit of Antichrist of Satan has been in this, in this world ever since Satan was thrown out of heaven. Lucifer was thrown out of heaven. We see him as an Antichrist throughout history. Hitler, Mussolini, Mussolini Stalin, Lenin, Mao Zedong in China, who in four years murdered 45 million people. Right now, Kim Jong-un, a satanic Antichrist spirit in that man. In four years, uh, uh, in Pol Pot in Cambodia, murdered close to 2.2 million in four years. Saddam Hussein, uh, and then uh, back in the, the years of, 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 of uh, Jesus, there were people like Herod, but he wasn't the only one that, was, that were murdering people. Antioch, Antiochus uh, Epiphanes, he was the first one to start crucifying people, crucifying Jews. Let me tell you something. The spirit of Antichrist is alive here today. Let me tell you that. 2 John verse 7 says this. This is the verse you want to look at. 2 John, there's only one chapter, verse 7. I say this because of many deceivers, look at this, who do not acknowledge Jesus Christ as coming in the flesh. Jesus Christ, God's Son, came, became a man. He humbled himself, became obedient to the death of the cross as a man. He overcame sin as a man. He came in flesh, human flesh. Those that do not acknowledge Jesus Christ as coming in the flesh have gone out into the world. Any such person is the deceiver and antichrist. 
Antichrist. Let me tell you, the spirit of Antichrist is here. And think of all the people who have been slaughtered or aborted under these satanically controlled individuals. Do you know that worse than any of the people that live is Satan himself? And the Bible says, John 10, 10, Jesus said, the thief has come, the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy, but I have come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. The key thief comes to steal. What's he want to steal? What is he stealing from you? Your money? He's stealing your, your cell phone? He's stealing your little tube, your TV tube? No, those are great tools of his. What is he stealing? Your faith. He's whispering, God doesn't care about you. God's not real. He's got all these people coming up with all these scientific stuff that they have no understanding of. And a true science will always come up with God is God. True science always comes up with that. I'm going to tell you that right now, and I'm not going into it, but I'm going to tell you. But he wants to whisper, to steal your faith, then kill you, and bring utter destruction to you and damnation, destroy you. But Jesus came that you could have life and have it to the full. Now listen to me. Talking about things being different, God hates certain things. He's got the Ten Commandments. The Bible says in Proverbs 6, 16, there's six things the Lord hates, seven that are detestable to him. Haughty eyes, a lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that devises wicked schemes, feet that are quick to rush into evil, a false witness who pours out lies, and a person who stirs up conflict in the community. Why did I read that? Because that's who Herod was. That's who Herod was. And a lot of Christians have some of these same things. Ask yourself, are you like that? Haughty eyes. That means somebody has to say, what's haughty? That's to be like a proud look. It's the same as a proud look. As another version says proud look. A lying tongue. Saying things that aren't true to benefit yourself or to tear someone else down. Hands that shed innocent blood. A heart that devises. That's, think about the, 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 the abortion industry. A heart that devises wicked schemes. You're whispering in the secret, dividing some scheme. Feet that are quick to rush into evil. Loves conflict. They rush into whatever's evil. A false witness who pours out lies. And a person who stirs up conflict in the community. God hates the Antichrist spirit. God hated all of these evil men that I mentioned that brought death to so many. And God hated what Herod did. But ask yourself, if you're king of your own selfish life, wouldn't you do some of these things to promote your agenda and your selfish way of life? When you read that Proverbs passage, do you do any of that and you find it kind of flows from self-preservation and self-exaltation and, and, to, and, to, and to carve out your corner and keep your status or improve your status? Look at the contrast of what God wants. It's total opposite of what he hates. And that's in Micah 6, 8. What has the Lord required of thee, O man, or, or it says, uh, what, uh, O mortal, what is good? And what does the Lord require of you? To act justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly before God. And then you impact people. But Satan lies to you to destroy you. And he says, oh, it won't hurt. Just one time. It's all right. Nobody will know. Here's what the Bible says about knowing. Do you believe that God knows everything and sees everything? There's nowhere you can go from the presence of God. That's what the Bible says. Here's what Luke 12, 2 and 3 says. There's nothing concealed that, you, that will not be disclosed or hidden that will not be made known. What you've said in the dark, you're whispering. Herod will be heard in the daylight. And what you whispered in the ear in the inner rooms will be proclaimed from the roofs. If you are lying, whispering, troublemaking person, you might be causing others to hate God in treatment. Your treatment might cause them to reject God and they may face eternal damnation. I believe God sees everything and he hears every word you speak. And I want to be a person like Micah says. I want to love mercy. I want to do justly and I want to walk humbly before God and I want to offer forgiveness. Luke 8, 17 says, there's nothing hidden that cannot, will not be disclosed and nothing concealed that will not be known or brought out into the open. The Bible says, by your words you're justified and by your words you're condemned. By what you say, there's life and there's death in the power of the tongue. And Matthew 5, 21 said, you've heard it said, the people long ago, you shall not murder and anyone who murders will be subject to judgment. But I tell you, anyone who's angry with the brother and sister will be subject to judgment. That's why forgiveness is so important. You say, well, I'm not angry. Yes, you are. Yes, you are. You won't forgive them. Yes, you are. You're hurt. You're hurtful, and yes, you are, and you're still talking. And you say, and you say to yourself that I have a right to talk because I was hurt. Everybody talks because they're hurt. Keep your mouth shut. Forgive. Move on. Let it be. Over. Done. History. Forgive. Nobody stays friends a lifetime without forgiveness. Even I, as perfect as I am, will hurt you sometimes. <laughs> I'm so glad you laughed because I'm hoping you would know that was obvious humor. 
But we have an enemy. His name is Satan. And in 2 Corinthians, here's what it says about Satan. 2 Corinthians 4.4. 4. It says this. The God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers so that they can't see the light of the gospel which displays the glory of Christ who is the image of God. So what are we going to do? we got to be Jesus for them. we got to be his voice, his hands, his love. we got to break down. we got to break through. we got to be the light so that we can open their eyes to see Jesus Christ in us. Ephesians 2.2 2 talks about the being prince of the power of the air. And it says, in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and the ruler of the kingdom of the air. That's this earth, that Satan, the spirit who is now at work in those that are disobedient. Disobedient people, Satan is a part of that. If you're being disobedient and you know it, and you go, I just don't want to do that. I don't want to do that. Maybe it's been your money. He says to the rich young ruler, go away. He went away. He said, give all. You sell everything. Give it all. He went away sad. Some people, they, they think, well, it's not my money. And they, they excuse themselves. They make up everything that they can make up to keep every bit of money they can keep instead of living for the things that are eternal and invisible. In John 12, 31, he says he's the ruler of this world. He says, now is the time for judgment on this world, but now the prince of this world would be driven out. Satan. It's talking about Satan. In John 8, 44, and it talks about there through 47. Listen to this. You belong to your father, the devil, and you want to carry out your father's desires. Satan, Jesus is talking to him. He, this Satan, he was a murderer from the beginning, not holding, holding to the truth. For there's no truth in Satan. When he lies, he speaks his native language. He, just, he can't help it, for he's a liar. And all lies. He's the father of all lies. Yet because I tell you the truth, you don't believe me. Can any of you prove me guilty of sin? If I'm telling the truth, why don't you believe me? Whoever belongs to God hears what God says. And the reason you don't hear it is that you don't belong to God. And when we're children of the devil, we hear the voice of the devil. When we're children of God, we hear the voice of truth. And there's a voice of truth that says you are special. You have a purpose. God has a plan. God will forgive you. God will help you. He loves you. Forgive. He will speak to you. Listen to me. Look at me. He will speak to you. And today he's speaking to you to make Jesus Christ the king of your life. Let's not just make it a religious belief system. Let's make Jesus Christ the full king of our life. And if you need anything, in just a moment, I'm going to say, come to this altar, and I want you to come. If you need victory over the enemy who's come against you, come and submit to the authority, the reign of Jesus Christ, and stop listening to the destructive lies of Satan. If you're insecure, he plays on that. Sin security is a reverse selfishness. It's self-focused. It's not spirit-focused. Those that are spiritually minded have life and peace. Those that are flesh minded, that are earthly minded, bring forth death. I'm going to tell you something. We got to think of others and think of Jesus. The Spirit thinks of others. Self thinks of myself. And forget that. Forget about everyone and what they think of you. If you need more of God, you need the power of the Spirit. You need to be refilled with the Spirit. You need more of Jesus. You need forgiveness of sin. You need to make Jesus king of your life. You might need healing. You might need a healing of a relationship, of a body. Whatever it is, we're going to invite you to come. Will you stand with me? Would you come right now? Stand and would you come right now? Move right this minute.